This morning, I'd like to talk about the rise of Chinese sea power, in particular, the naval dimension of Chinese sea power. One of the themes that I'll be hitting upon this morning is that the Chinese have, in fact, been taking the strategy and war course alongside with us. Chinese analysts have engaged the theorists that we've studied in the course, of course, two of whom they can claim as their own, Sun Tzu and Mao Zedong. Chinese analysts have also been thinking in terms of naval operational concepts that harken back to many of the case studies that we've studied for this course. And so this lecture, in many ways, it's essentially a retrospective on the course through Chinese eyes. And speaking of Chinese eyes, one of the things that caught the eyes of the Chinese and caught the Chinese imagination is what is this image captured by a TV camera. And this is a scene of two shooters launching an aircraft off of China's newly commissioned Liaoning aircraft carrier. This became an iconic image to the Chinese public. It was sort of a top gun moment for the Chinese. And the Chinese began to essentially take pictures of themselves in this pose and posting them on the internet, instantly becoming an internet sensation. In fact, this was China's version of the Gangnam style fever that caught the United States uh, earlier this year. So we have a Chinese dude on a bed, <laughs> a lady in tights, a kid on a sofa, and then this creepy dude without a shirt on. Uh, now, you know, this is funny and sort of strange, right? And I think it's worth actually making two points out of this particular internet sensation. First of all is how much we Americans take naval power for granted. We have multiple aircraft carriers in multiple theaters operating virtually simultaneously. In fact, we probably have an aircraft landing or taking off right now. This is an entirely new experiment, a new project for the Chinese. The novelty of it can be shown by this internet sensation. The second point worth making is that this is indeed a national project for the Chinese. This is a prestige project for the government. And that's why the government has gone to great lengths to gain popular support for this project. And the Chinese are watching this very, very closely, every failure and every success. And this immediately lets me bridge back to the Russo-Japanese War. As you recall, the Japanese government went to great lengths to buoy public support and maintain public support for the naval war against Russia. In fact, they went to great lengths to hide the devastating losses when they lost those two battleships during the war. So one of the things that I think we should pay close attention to is the social dimension of Chinese sea power. This is particularly important as nationalism becomes an increasingly important component of Chinese state and society. All right, as you know, when I begin my lectures, I usually want to go to the so what factor, explain to you why I should spend an hour of your precious time talking about any particular given issue. Well, I'm going to do something slightly different today. I'm going to start by telling you what this lecture is not about. As you know, things in Washington have gotten pretty polarized. Everything is pitched in black and white terms, good and evil, right versus wrong. And the debate about China and China's rise and China's military are no different. In fact, things in, in terms of debates in China, things have essentially boiled down to this. You're either a panda hugger or a panda slugger. Uh, you're either too hard on China or too soft on China, right? Uh, and uh, what I want to do is to emphatically state to you that this lecture is not about pandering to either side of the debate. I'm not going to tell you that the Chinese are coming, right? <laughs> that we have to run around with a hair on fire thinking about how we should kill the panda. Nor am I going to tell you that China is some sort of an endangered species, all right? <laughs> that we have to treat kindly and gently, all right? that it's a nice little cuddly panda bear. Um, China is, in fact, a serious power. The Chinese people think of China today as a great rising power. And China was, for centuries, the dominant power of East Asia for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I think we need to treat Chinese power very seriously. Now, the picture on the right actually deserves a little bit more commentary. That's actually a senior official uh, in the Bush administration, who in 2005 coined the phrase responsible stakeholder to describe China's ro role in world affairs. What was fascinating about that episode was that it sent Chinese policymakers scrambling because 
they didn't have an exact Chinese word for stakeholder. It wasn't in the dictionary. Showcasing a potential chasm already in worldviews between China and the United States. And there he is, Mr. Robert Zellick, literally hugging a panda. Now, what I would like to argue is that we can, in fact, have a reasoned debate about the Chinese military, neither making it out to be 10 feet tall nor making it out to be a midget. We can actually have a debate somewhere in between. And we can have this debate for two reasons that actually emanate from China itself. The first one is the rise of a military intellectual complex, as opposed to a military industrial complex, composed of analysts, strategists, and senior officers who have openly talked about China's choices at sea. The senior officer on the left is General Luo Yuan, who's been on TV shows and written in op-eds, speaking openly about how China should take a much harder line against the United States at sea. The senior officer on the right is Admiral Yang Yi. He too has been in China and all over the world talking about Chinese sea power choices. In fact, he led a delegation to the Naval War College to discuss the prospects for Sino-US cooperation. So the Chinese are telling us what they think, and we had better listen. The purpose of this lecture, in part, is to open a window onto Chinese strategic debates about their choices at sea. The second trend is a material one. There is clearly a major transition going on in the Chinese Navy. It has made advances by leaps and bounds in both qualitative and quantitative terms. The Chinese Navy has transitioned from a largely defensive coastal force composed of obsolescent Soviet technologies as represented by the ship in the foreground to an increasingly modern, capable force able to wage the rigors of 21st century warfare at sea as represented by the ship in the background, often dubbed China's Aegis. Something is clearly going on in the material sense. Let me take you back about a decade ago. Professor Bernard Cole, professor at the National War College, uh, a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Navy and a leading authority on the Chinese Navy had this to say in his classic work called The Great Wall at Sea. His argument was, ah, who cares about the Chinese Navy? The Chinese Navy is no match against the United States. It's no match against Japan. And even the small Taiwanese Navy could handle the Chinese Navy. Nothing to see here. Move along. Um, and I think his statement here actually reflected a lot of the thinking in Washington in the 1990s. The typical reframe that you would hear in think tanks across Washington was that China's coercive option against Taiwan would be a million-man swim, a highly condescending attitude towards the Chinese military. Yet this very same person, six years later, had this to say. Given the trend lines in China's naval modernization, China would be able to command the East and South China Sea a few years from today. And that, in fact, the Chinese Navy would be able to exert hegemonic leverage in maritime East Asia a few years from today. Wow, what an about face. He essentially changed his mind within a span of about five or six years. So something is clearly happening to the Chinese Navy in a material sense. Admiral Willard. The former head of PACOM had this to say a few years ago. He essentially argued that the intelligence community and the China watching community had persistently underestimated China's naval and military developments year in and year out over the past decade, a blunt admission for someone of his stature. A few years ago, the Chinese unveiled the stealth fighter. Right? This turned out to be a technical military surprise for many American observers because many Americans thought that this aircraft would not take to the air until 2020. And there, the Chinese pilots are partying like it's 1999, celebrating the first flight of this aircraft. Again, constantly going much faster than our estimates of China's military developments. Now, you might think, hmm, so what? China is starting from such a low baseline that anything China does is going to seem like a great achievement. One could also argue that China has been growing tremendously over the past two decades. Some of that wealth is always going to find its way to the military. So it shouldn't be surprising that China's military modernization is advancing so quickly. So why should China's sea power rise engage America's strategic interests? Well, I'm going to start my argument with this premise. <clears throat> 
and that is America's command of the global commons. The global commons is generally understood as any medium through which goods and services can be transported from point A to point B on any point on the globe, including military power. And it is America's capacity to have unfettered use of the global commons, whether it's the high seas, air, space, and now increasingly cyberspace, that allows America to be the top dog in the international system, to be the number one power in the world stage because of its ability to project that kind of power over tremendous amounts of distance. This is what makes America number one. And in fact, if you think about our campaign planning, beginning with the first Gulf War all the way through OEF and OIF. It is virtually genetically encoded in our thinking that we have to seize command of the commons, make unfettered use of the commons, deny the commons to enemy use, and to defeat any adversary's attempts to deny us access to the commons. And herein lies the problem set. This is why China Sea Power Rise should engage our strategic interests. And that's the emergence of the contested zone the contested zone basically argues that a local power with superior knowledge of local conditions could put together a set of doctrines, capabilities, and strategies that would make it awfully dangerous for American forces to operate in their own backyards. That second and third rate militaries can cobble together a set of capabilities that would make it highly lethal for American forces to operate in their neighborhoods. As a corollary, it means that countries that are putting up these contested zones, like China, do not have to compete with us symmetrically in order to challenge our operations in their own neighborhoods. Right? They do not have to reach military parity. They do not have to catch up with us across all spectrums of military operations in order to make it highly dangerous for US forces. In fact, this concern about the contested zone has found expression at the highest levels of the US government. The defense strategic guidance issued last year, in fact, is remarkable for naming names. It came right out and said, China and Iran are the two regional powers that are putting up these contested zones through anti-access and area denial capabilities. So my goal today is to unpack this concept of the contested zone by, first of all, talking about the theoretical foundations of Chinese sea power, their embrace of Mahan. Second, talk a little bit about where the contested zone will likely take place, somewhere between the first and second island chain for the time being. Talk a little bit about Chinese naval strategy by engaging in a dialogue between Corbett and Mao, a sea power theorist and a land power theorist. And then talk about the capabilities that the Chinese have been building, bridging back to previous case studies where there are technical analogs that we can discuss. So let's get right to it. Let's talk about China's turn to Mahan. China's increasing interest, in fact, I would say obsession with Mahan's theoretical writings, is actually a very interesting intellectual twist. Because in Maoist China, Mahan was persona non grata. You could not talk about Mahan in any meaningful sense, because he was seen as a promoter of colonialism and Western imperialism. And of course, China fell prey to imperial Western aggression that led to the century of humiliation. So, Chinese analysts could not even approach the topic of Mahan. But by the 1990s, as China opened up even more to the world, as China became increasingly dependent on seaborne commerce, Chinese analysts began to turn to Mahan and embraced his writings. To use Mahan as an analytical framework to get them to start thinking about China's sea power choices. Now, what evidence do I have for that? Well, I've got about a dozen Chinese translations of Mahan's influence of sea power two of which deserve particular attention. The book on the, both books are actually published by the People's Liberation Army Press, so it's the official publishing house of the Chinese military. The first translation of Mahan's Influence of Sea Power, which was of course assigned to you earlier uh, this, this term, uh, was published in 1998. The second edition was published in 2004. The second run of the second edition was published in 2008, attesting to the tremendous intellectual interest in, in Mahan's writing. But this is not restricted to the elite level. In fact, there are more translations of Mahan's influence of sea power for public consumption, including this version. And the bottom caption of the front cover asks rhetorically, does China need a carrier? 
Of course, the answer is yes. The Chinese have got the Liaoning now. I want to spend a few more minutes, actually, talking about this particular assessment of Mahan's writing. It's basically a biography of Mahan and a summary of his writings, written by two senior colonels of the People's Liberation Army. I'll get back to senior colonel Chen Zhou, the lead author, a little bit later. But what do they say in the preface? Well, in the preface, they sound a Mahanian tone. They say, China's pursuit of sea power is an inevitable choice. Inevitable because China has legitimate national security and sovereignty concerns that would require China to develop sea power to protect them. And that because of China's growing economic ties to the rest of the world, growing seaborne commerce requires China to develop sea power in, in, in order to protect China's economic interests. And this interplay between national security and economics is precisely what Mahan was, talk about, was talking about in his writings. And in order to pursue sea power, these authors argue that China need to build comprehensive capabilities that not only included a naval fleet, a merchant fleet, a fishing fleet, a maritime law enforcement fleet, and a massive basing infrastructure to support all of these fleets. Now, if Mahan were alive and he had a chance to read this preface, I'm sure he would have given these two authors a standing ovation with tears rolling down his cheeks, right? I mean, this is exactly what he's talking about, a holistic, comprehensive approach to sea power. Now, you might say, hmm, you know, senior colonels in the PLA, they're a dime a dozen. Maybe these are underemployed military officers with too much time on their hands uh, that basically turn to Mahan as an intellectual hobby. Well, think again. Senior Colonel Chen Zhou, the lead author of this volume, was the principal architect of the 2004 defense white paper which is considered in, chi in the China watching community here as the most authoritative statement of China's defense policy. And you can see senior Colonel Chen Zhou's fingerprints all over this document, talking about the struggle for strategic points and strategic resources. And this document calls for the PLA to develop the capabilities to command the air and command the sea. The first time that this document actually expressed this Mahanian uh, principle of winning command of the commons. Now, just on a personal note, I actually had the chance to meet senior Colonel Chen Zhou personally when he was a visiting scholar at Harvard. So he is a real person, first of all. Uh, he's articulate, he's smart, and he clearly has policy influence. This also allows us to immediately flash back to one of the cases that we've studied. We know that the Imperial Japanese Navy Sent, sometimes sent their best to the United States to get their education. Not so coincidentally, Admiral Yamamoto was a visiting fellow, visiting scholar at Harvard. Let me now turn to the outgoing commander of the Chinese Navy, Admiral Wu Shenli. And in a very authoritative journal article, he makes a couple of rationales for why China should pursue sea power. First of all, he makes a historical argument. He says that because of China's weakness at sea historically, that was why China fell prey to the century of humiliation. Western imperial aggression all came from the sea, and it was because China was defenseless against that aggression that China then went into a period of steep decline. His message here, never again, never again will we allow Western powers to exploit our weakness at sea. The lesson here is we need to build sea power to protect our maritime interests. What is fascinating about this passage is the fact that the Chinese are counting, and they all agree on this particular number. 400, precisely, 470 invasions from the sea, big and small. The Chinese have a chip on their shoulders, and the Admiral wants to right this historical wrong. The second argument the Admiral makes is an oceanic one, is a geographical one, where he says, China, in a very startling statement, is not a continental power, but it's in fact an oceanic nation. And, he rattle off, and, and then he rattles off all of these statistics proving that China was indeed an oceanic nation. Then he makes a third argument. He argues that the Chinese people and the Chinese Communist Party have collectively made a decision, a deliberate policy choice to pursue sea power. And so this interplay between geography and choice, or to put another way, between destiny and choice, is precisely the interplay that Mahan was talking about in that chapter on the six elements of sea power. So here we have, again, Admiral Wu Li sounding some very interesting Mahanian themes. 
So much for the theory. Let me now talk about geography. The Chinese like to think of their maritime world, they like to think about their maritime domain by describing these lines at sea. Uh, and they're called the first and second island chains. Uh, the first island chain starts from the Kurile, stretches down into Southeast Asia. The second island chain stretches from Japan as well, but then curves outwards through the Mariana, centered on Guam, and then wends its way back into Southeast Asia. It's, in, it's, it's important to note that this is an inherently Sinocentric view. Right? It's the first and second island chain if you are sitting in Beijing looking out into the Western Pacific. Now, what's interesting is the Chinese historical interpretation of the origins of the first and second island chain. The Chinese actually give credit to, or more precisely, lay blame on the Americans for starting this construct of the first and second island chain. And who are the villains in this narrative? Who are the bad guys in this storyline about how the Americans started this whole thing? Well, their villains are Secretary of State Dean Acheson, General Douglas MacArthur, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, and President Eisenhower. Why? Because all of them had, at some point or another in the early years of the Cold War, articulated the need for the United States to have military bases on those island chains in order to contain Chinese and Soviet communist power. And if you look at, and all you have to do is look at the map. Here is an awesome New York Times map uh, after the outbreak of the Korean War. As you'll recall, Secretary of State Dean Acheson, in a famous speech, deliberately, or perhaps by mistake, excluded the Korean Peninsula when he talked about the defense perimeter of the Pacific. But after the outbreak of the Korean War, you can see how the defense perimeter inched westward to include South Korea. But what is interesting is that this perimeter actually deliberately skirts east of Taiwan because at least at that point, we had not decided to extend our security guarantees to the nationalists. Here's another wonderful map. This is actually my favorite uh, and, and by the Christian Science Monitor. And it literally depicts the US military bases along the First Island chain as a metal chain that stretches from Alaska through the Kuriles, I mean, through the Aleutians, through Japan, notice the link right over South Korea, and again, skirting east of Taiwan and terminating in the Philippines. But following the Taiwan Strait crisis of 1954, the defense perimeter shifts westward further still. You can see that the United States by this point had extended security guarantees to Taiwan, so the defense perimeter is now west of Taiwan and not so coincidentally terminates at the point dividing North and South Vietnam, in many ways foreshadowing our commitment 10 years later. And now, I don't want to put words in the mouths of the Chinese, so I'm going to let the Chinese speak for themselves. Here's a Chinese map, a 21st century view of the first island chain. And this one is actually far more expansive than some of our more usual interpretations of the first island chain. It starts from the Aleutians, down through the Kuriles, through Japan, through the Ryukyus, and terminates all the way in Singapore. The white boxes here along the first island chain are basically the major naval bases and access points for US forces. Then we have the second island chain centered on Guam. But wait, there's the third island chain centered on Hawaii. And the white box above Hawaii Islands is just the seventh fleet. So you can see, if you're sitting in Beijing, looking out into the Western Pacific, what you see is essentially concentric rings of American military power that could, in fact, be configured to contain China's maritime ambitions. Now, it's not just a defense issue. It's also a geoeconomic issue. Chinese mariners cannot make their way out to the high seas, cannot conduct trans-Pacific trade with the United States without passing through, at some point, the narrow seas and channels formed by the first island chain. And it's important to note that all of the occupants of the first island chain are either formal allies or friendly partners of the United States. This, of course, deeply impacts China's geoeconomic insecurities. And as a result of defense concerns as well as geoeconomic insecurities, the Chinese have for decades actually formulated this notion of a near seas defense. The goal for the Chinese is to be able to assert greater control over the bodies of water bounded by the first island chain and to be eventually be able to extend that influence beyond the first island chains. 
The Near Sea Strategies was first formulated by Admiral Liu Huaqing, considered the founder of the modern Chinese Navy. He's often dubbed China's Mahan. And what he argued was that China needed to build up its naval forces to control events in the Near Seas, which is the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea, and the South China Sea, and then over time to go beyond that. And so here is a graphic representation of this. Liu essentially envisioned that the Chinese, over a period of time, would be able to assert great control over these bodies of water, and then eventually extend the ability to control events all the way out to the body of water bounded by the second island chain. So there are two observations that can be made from this. The first one is that one could argue that this is a very continentalist attitude or a very continentalist worldview. The Chinese are essentially extending terrestrial defense from the Chinese coastline out to the first island chain and out to the second island chain. The second observation is that the first and second island chains essentially serve as a useful geographic marker for how far Chinese naval forces and other forces need to project power out to. So this provides a sort of a nice planning parameter by which the Chinese can think about the future of Chinese naval power. And China's recent naval activism is clearly having an interactive impact on its neighbors, particularly Japan. This is a map issued annually by the Ministry of Defense in Tokyo, and it essentially depicts all of China's major naval activities, including penetrations through the first island chain. Japan cannot but be deeply concerned about China's growing naval activism, because after all, Japan is the occupant of the entire northern half of the first island chain. Whatever China does in the near seas will have a direct security impact on Japan. And so in many ways, in this narrow sense at least, geography is in fact destiny. Let me now talk a little bit about Chinese naval strategy. And here I'd like to have a debate or a conversation between Corbett and Mao. As you know, Corbett had a much more subtle interpretation and understanding of naval power. In contrast, Mahan, for example, had only one answer in the use of naval power, right? Attack, offense. Scenario one, attack. Scenario two, attack. Scenario three, attack. Corbett said no. There is actually a role, a proper role, and a very effective role for defense. That in fact, there are certain circumstances in which it would benefit the sea power to be on the defensive. But it's not passive defense. It has to be going on the defense in the expectation of going on the counterattack. Right? There's no such thing as passive defense. Corbett also argued that under certain circumstances when the sea power is on the defensive, particularly defending local waters, that local sea power has superior knowledge of local conditions. That enables that particular defending side to lay traps in order to surprise the adversary who is not likely to have as much familiarity with those local waters. So there is indeed a place for the defense, but it has to be defense in the expectation of going back on the offense. Now Mao could not have agreed more. When Mao talked about active defense, it is exactly Corbett's notion of going on the defense in the expectation of going on the offense. In fact, he's emphatic, right? That passive defense is a spurious kind of defense. It's no defense at all. He says that only a madman or a fool would engage in passive defense. The only reason why you would go on the defense is that you would set up the conditions in order for you to be able to go back on the offensive. What is remarkable in terms of Mao's thinking about active defense is how it continues to find influence in current Chinese doctrine. In Chinese naval doctrine, offshore defense remains a key principle of Chinese naval operations. And this is actually a definition of offshore defense based on the Chinese Navy's official encyclopedia. According to the Chinese Navy, offshore defense requires the use of mobile combat, mobile operations and tactics, in order to gradually attrit the adversary, and through a series of blows, would be able to gradually convert the strategic picture from the strategic defense to the offense, because the balance of power would increasingly favor China. And at some point, the, the naval balance of power would shift to such an extent, it would allow China to go on the strategic counteroffensive. Now, of course, if Mao were alive and he had a chance to read this definition, he would have instantly recognized it as his own. Offshore defense is essentially active defense at sea. 
Now, this is a meaty paragraph, and we don't have time to go over the language of this particular paragraph. What I want to do is emphasize uh, what he's trying to say here about operations along interior and exterior lines. What he's trying to say here really is that under certain situations when you're on the defensive operating behind interior lines, you can create essentially micro offensives within this larger strategic defensive where you can amass superior force against the adversary. And that will allow you the tactical and operational opportunity to gradually strategically attrit the adversary, thus changing the larger balance of power. So, what does Mao, Mao actually mean by this? Well, let me use a graph to, to uh, show you what he meant. I want you to imagine that Mao's forces are operating along interior lines. He's operating from a defensive central position. When you're in a defensive central position, you benefit from shorter lines of communications. You benefit from the ability to concentrate force at any point of attack against an enemy that's trying to attack you along exterior lines. I want you to further imagine nationalist or Japanese forces operating along exterior lines. What Mao was trying to do was to lure the enemy in deep, lure one element of this strategically superior adversary deep behind enemy lines so that it had advanced beyond the culminating point of advance. By this point, this particular unit has formed its own interior lines within this larger strategic defensive. And it is at that point that Mao would unleash his superior numerically superior forces at that particular locale, at that particular time, to engage in a battle of annihilation and hopefully to eliminate that particular threat. Mao believed that if he could do this over and over and over again, it would lead to strategic attrition, eventually changing the balance of power and, and, and allowing China to go back on the strategic counteroffensive. Now, how does this concept apply to China today in the maritime domain? Well. China today in the 21st century, much like Mao's forces, is relatively weak. But it too, like Mao's forces, operates from a central defensive position on the Chinese mainland. And you can, you can think of the first island chain as the interior line. Chinese forces then has the luxury of concentrating force, concentrating mass, at any particular point along that defensive line. The United States, by contrast, not only has to conquer the tyranny of distance through the Western Pacific, but the United States also has to concentrate in space. It has to seek to defeat the ability of the defender to concentrate in space by attacking along multiple axes at multiple times. This is one way of thinking about the military or strategic balance between China and the United States. The question for the long term is, as China's military modernization increases, to what extent will this interior line actually go farther and farther out into the Western Pacific? Now I'd like to talk about the material dimension of Chinese strategy and flash back to previous case studies that illustrate and that have parallels to the capabilities that the Chinese are developing today. Let's flash back to the Russo-Japanese War that we've studied. Mine played an outsized role in this war. The mine killed Makarov, which sealed the fate of the Port Arthur fleet and killed the offensive spirit of the Russian fleet. The mines sunk the Japanese battleships, two of them, right, destroying a third of the Japanese battleship, uh, battle fleet in quick succession, casting a huge pall over this entire conflict. We now know that the Chinese have aggressively engaged in investments in strategic mine warfare. In fact, China probably has the largest stockpile of sea mines in the entire world. If the Chinese were to employ this mine warfare against Taiwan, it would cause huge problems for Taiwan, and it would cause huge problems for us if we ever decided to intervene. Let's flash back again to the Russo-Japanese War. Both sides made extensive use of torpedo boats and torpedo destroyers. As you recall, in the opening phase of the war, Admiral Togo kicked off his surprise attack with the use of torpedo boats. We know that at the tail end of the Battle of the Yellow Sea, Togo held back his forces because he was afraid that Russian torpedo boats might be able to go after his capital ships. We know at the end of the victorious Battle of Tsushima, Togo very effectively used his torpedo boats and torpedo destroyers to engage in mop-up operations scoring some important hits against Russian capital ships. Let's flash back to the Pacific War. 
the Japanese again made very effective use of their tor heavily armed torpedo destroyers. These destroyers perfected the art of night combat. The Japanese had hoped to use concealment, to use night as a form of concealment to enable the Japanese to engage in surprise attacks against the American battle fleet. And that with the aid of the long lance torpedo, the Japanese hoped to outrange the American capital ships, hoping to sow chaos and confusion and engaging in this battle of attrition across the Pacific. Now, while technologies have changed, the logic has remained the, cha has remained the same. The Chinese have produced this catamaran, uh, stealthy catamaran that's highly nimble, nimble, very fast, and pack an outsized punch. This stealthy, fast attack boat is armed with long-range anti-ship cruise missiles designed specifically to go after capital ships. The, Ch the, the, the Chinese are hoping to use these catamarans uh, to engage in swarming attacks, to engage in mop-up operations, and to engage in surprise attacks by the use of stealth. This is their form of concealment. Let's flash back again to the Pacific War. The Japanese designed and built these long-range submarines to engage in interceptive operations to attrit the Pacific fleet as it crossed into Japanese home waters. We know that the Chinese have made the buildup of their submarine the centerpiece of their naval modernization. And these submarines are armed to the teeth with things like home, uh, uh, home wake, uh, wake homing torpedoes um, as well as long-range anti-ship cruise missiles. Now, this is the technical development that I'd like to focus on a little bit more this morning, and that is the notion of shore-based firepower. These, this is a rare and a terrific picture of Russian artillery, shore-based firepower, that formed rings around Port Arthur. And as you'll recall, it was because of the fierce fires from these artillery pieces that forced Togo to give up uh, pressing on his attack after his first uh, night of the surprise attack. If we flash back to the Pacific War, in the early phases of that war, the Japanese swept through Southeast Asia, trying to seize the southern resource areas. In the process, Japanese twin-engine bombers were able to intercept a British task force and was able to sink the capital ships HMS Repulse and the HMS Prince of Wales, sending shockwaves not only to Britain, but shocking Churchill himself. This represented the first time in naval history in which uh, shore-based bombers were air power alone, essentially, was able to sink capital ships while they were underway. And this map showcases how you can conceive of this as, ex as essentially extended shore-based firepower. The Japanese launched those bombers actually from airfields south of Saigon, intercepted this task force, and sank those two capital ships. Another form of shore-based firepower is the kamikaze. The kamikaze is essentially um, manned cruise missiles launched from airfields. We now know from our case study that Japan had planned a ferocious defense of the Japanese home islands if the United States had actually decided to invade the home islands. The Japanese still had about 10,000 aircraft, of which half of them would be devoted to kamikaze missions. Imagine hundreds, if not thousands of Japanese kamikazes, cruise missiles essentially, raining down on American amphibious forces. It could well have been a bloodbath. So, what are the Chinese doing? Well, the Chinese are investing in long-range anti-ship cruise missiles, another form of extended shore-based firepower on fixed sites on land. But the Chinese are also developing a triad. They're putting these missiles on land-based trucks, they're putting them on shore-based fixed-wing aircraft, and they're putting them on ships and submarines. Here's an interesting technical development. It's the anti-ship ballistic missile, the so-called ASBIM, and this is the likely airframe that will use this technology. Well, what is the anti-ship ballistic missile? Well, it's designed so that the Chinese can launch a ballistic missile from the mainland. The warhead will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at high velocities, but would be able to accurately pinpoint a moving target at sea. The Chinese call this the carrier killer. They openly call it the carrier killer. This, again, allows China to influence events at sea directly from land through shore-based, extended shore-based firepower. If you put all of these capabilities together, what you have is active defense at sea, or what the Chinese called offshore defense. And it is the use of offensive capabilities, 
offensive platforms and capabilities that not so coincidentally reaches out to the second island chain. And if you see the gradation of the color, the color gets darker and darker as you get closer to the Chinese shoreline. Well, that signifies the growing density, the growing volume of these offensive weaponry as you get closer and closer to China's shores. In other words, as the US fleet gets closer and closer to China's backyard, it becomes more and more lethal for American forces. Mao would have smiled at this concept because it is highly consistent with his notion of active defense, the micro-offensive within a larger strategic defensive. Now, this is nothing new in history. The Imperial Japanese Navy thought in these terms of using layered offenses to gradually attrit at the adversary. The Japanese planned to use long-range submarines and shore-based bombers that I just showcased to you to intercept the to intercept the Pacific Fleet as it crossed into the Pacific. The Japanese hoped to gradually attrit the Pacific Fleet so that the naval balance would eventually shift in favor of Japan, or at least even up the naval balance, so that the Japanese would then be able to engage in that Mahanian decisive engagement at sea. That the Japanese would at least stand a chance of winning that Mahanian sea battle. And senior US policymakers have explicitly made this analogy to Japan including uh, the former CNO, Admiral Ruffhead, who said what the Japanese were trying to do, like the Chinese, is to deny us access into the Western Pacific. Secretary Work, before he became a senior official, had this to say as well. In fact, he said this is the third time that the United States has faced this kind of a challenge in which the defender's offensive platforms outranges the offensive strike of US naval aviation, the first time being the Japanese, the second time being the late stages of uh, the Cold War, and the third time now, the rise of the so-called Chinese maritime strike complex. A noted Asian security watcher, retired Rear Admiral Mike McDivitt, wrote in a piece that explicitly talks about, again, how this is the third time. This is not new. We've seen this. This is the third time we've seen this in maritime Asia. The Japanese, again, were trying to use submarines and bombers to whittle away at Pacific forces. But this is what's sobering. Despite Japan's strategic blunders and operational mistakes that we studied in the Pacific War case, it took us 30 months to tear down this anti-access wall. So the Pentagon essentially agrees with this assessment about this anti-access area denial challenge. The Pentagon issues an annual report on Chinese military power. And in the earlier versions of these reports, basically argues that the Chinese, in fact, seeking to have this multi-layered offensive capability that reaches out to the second island chain that directly puts American surface forces at risk. And to be entirely bipartisan in this case, the Pentagon under the Obama administration essentially agrees. The Chinese are seeking to use offensive capabilities multi-layered all the way out into the depths of the Western Pacific. And the latest report on Chinese military power specifically identifies the anti-ship ballistic missile as a capability that's designed to target the US aircraft carrier. All right, so let me try to wrap this up by first of all talking about what this means. What does China want? Well, I think some historical context is necessary. In 1996, there was a presidential election, the first democratic election on the island of Taiwan. And the Chinese, in an attempt to coerce the populace to prevent them from voting in a pro-independence candidate, decided to conduct live fire missile exercises that bracketed the island, causing panic, causing confusion, leading to great tension. The Clinton administration decided to dispatch two carrier battle groups to the vicinity of Taiwan as a show of force to demonstrate American resolve to get the Chinese to back down. This was, of course, the classic Clausewitzian definition of war by algebra. The Chinese leadership, to their dismay, in fact, to their absolute horror, realized that they had zero military options against this show of force. In fact, there are rumors that the Chinese leadership didn't even know where the carriers were. And so the lesson for the Chinese was, never again. We will never allow the Americans to humiliate us like this ever again. And therefore, not so coincidentally, the much more rapid military buildup that we saw from the, from the mid-1960s can be traced to that particular event. Now, there's also a historical parallel to be made to our course 
and that is the Sino-Japanese War that served as the context for the Russo-Japanese War. As you recall, the Japanese defeated the Chinese and was going to seize the Liaotong Peninsula as one of its war prizes. Well, Western imperial powers intervened, called the Triple Intervention, and forced the, forced the Japanese to relinquish that claim. And what did the Japanese conclude? Never again. Never again will we let the Western imperial powers tell us what to do in East Asia, and that served as part of the strategic context for the Russo-Japanese War. Now, this notion of anti-access can also be understood as an attempt to attack American strategy, because American action, American policy in East Asia cannot be fully enacted in the absence of access not only to the airspace and waters in East Asia, but also to the critical bases across the first island chain. So the fact that Chinese are hoping to deny us, us access is kicking, a, kicking the strut of one of our, the key pillars of our strategy in East Asia. The Chinese also are very shrewdly using their own territory as a form of defense. As you recall, China loomed large as a sanctuary in the Korean War and in the Vietnam War. The Chinese are now using their own territory as a form of sanctuary today. If you look at all of those offensive platforms that I just discussed with you in this maritime strike complex, all of them emanate from the Chinese mainland. If the United States were to seek to eliminate this threat, the most operationally efficacious method is to directly go after those assets on the mainland. But what's operationally efficacious is not strategically or politically efficacious at all. No president in the White House, in either administration, would willy-nilly decide to conduct deep strikes against a great power, against a nuclear-armed great power. And that is the political message that the Chinese are trying to send to us. Beijing is saying, I dare you. I dare you to conduct deep strikes on the, on, on the Chinese homeland, posing really quite a big political problem for the White House. To me, the goal of the Chinese is not to engage in some sort of a decisive battle to defeat us at sea. The Chinese are actually in this peacetime competition seeking to increase American perceptions of cost and risks in intervening in anything that's related to what China cares about. What the Chinese are hoping to do is to induce caution, induce hesitation, creating hemming and hawing inside the White House that leads to delay and perhaps even inaction. That that would buy the Chinese enough time to wrap up whatever dispute that they have and then to present the international community and the United States with a fait accompli. And so really what the Chinese are doing is hoping that no shots will be fired in the first place. The United States would hesitate for so long that it would be too late for the United States to intervene. So in some ways, this harkens back to our theorist Sun Tzu about winning without fighting. This is a Chinese form of deterrence to keep us from acting in the first place. This now leads me to my conclusions about what this means. I think that there are some larger strategic implications that this whole concept of the contested zone raises. The first one is, what would we do if we had another Taiwan Strait crisis? Would we engage in another war by algebra? by sending carrier strike groups to the vicinity of Taiwan. Now, we all know that there's the rapprochement, things are looking pretty uh, good, but you never know. Domestic politics in Taiwan remains volatile. We could find ourselves in a situation like 1996 again, but the question for US policymakers is this. Would the president actually do it again? Dispatch carrier strike groups to demonstrate American resolve. And if we don't do it, what are the consequences of that? The second is a technical development. If China's military modernization continues apace, we could see what was a contested zone, in other words, a costly place to go into, into a hyper anti-axis zone, a place that would be insane to even try to get into, right? Rather than a contested zone, we might see the emergence of no-go zones, places that we could not contemplate going into. What does that imply? And this raises some larger offense-defense balance questions. As you recall, the Russo-Japanese War was really the precursor to a shift to a defense-dominant paradigm. The emergence of the mine, of the torpedo, of shore-based artillery in the Russo-Japanese War meant that it, those technologies favored those on the defense on land against those projecting power from the sea. We saw that play itself out much more fully in World War I. 
We saw in World War II where the pendulum swung back to the offensive dominant paradigm, the introduction of naval aviation, the introduction of amphibious warfare, the introduction of offensive submarine warfare doctrine, brought mobility back to sea as highlighted by the American island hopping campaign in the Pacific. In the late stages of the Cold War, we saw glimmers of a shift back to a more defensive dominant paradigm. Remember, the Soviets had developed these strategic bombers and armed them to the teeth with long-range anti-ship cruise missiles designed to penetrate U.S. fleet defenses. The United States, at least at that point, was able to come up with a technical counter, the Aegis, for example, that was designed to kill the archer before the archer could release his arrow. Today, are we in fact seeing a more permanent shift to a defense dominant paradigm as China's maritime strike complex grows stronger, grows sturdier, the barrier getting stronger and stronger day by day. So there are some larger strategic issues worth considering in that realm. From a, from a policy and political standpoint, now, we've made promises to ourselves over the past two decades that we would have absolute command of the commons, right? The maritime strategy that's been assigned to you uh, this week states emphatically that the United States will, in fact, be able to assert local sea control wherever necessary by ourselves if we have to. Wow. Can we actually keep that promise? Or are we beginning to write checks? that will bounce. And that's certainly something that we should be thinking about. And that leads us to some larger policy questions about our policy towards Asia. Our policy towards the region has been animated by twin principles. The first one is to ensure unfettered economic, diplomatic, political, and then military access to the region. And the second principle is to prevent the rise of a hostile hegemon that can fundamentally reshift the balance of power that would be unfavorable to U.S. interests. These two principles have underwritten U.S. policy towards Asia since the days of Theodore Roosevelt and it was arguably for those reasons that we went to war against Japan. Are we prepared to revisit those assumptions underlying those two principles? And if we do, what does it imply in terms of our long-term relationships with countries that we've developed since the end of World War II? So hopefully what I've been able to illustrate to you this morning, firstly and most importantly, is the relevance of this course. How you can apply the theorists, the course concepts, the course themes from this course, and apply them to understand an urgent policy challenge in East Asia. And secondly, Hopefully what I've been able to illustrate to you also is that operational matters do have political implications. That a largely operational challenge in terms of the contested zone actually raises a range of strategic dilemmas and political problems that we are only just beginning to address and something that we will be facing, I think, in the coming years. So with that, let me conclude my remarks and be happy to take your questions.